The Textile Mill It is an uncommon sight in the modern American Northeast, but these buildings once populated the banks of New England rivers. They drew their power from the raging waters of the Merrimack and Connecticut, and, using southern cotton, churned out the clothes of the nation. More than any business since, they influenced the growth of industrial and residential development, providing livelihoods for tens of thousands of workers over a 100-year period, and forming the basis for what are now known as mill towns. Labor and mills also prompted important development in workers' rights and provided an example for the interaction between labor and management. It is hard to overestimate the importance of mills as a component of New England's history. How did the mill come to be so central to the culture and economy of the Northeast? The answer lies at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. The Industrial Revolution was a time of great change around the world. It began in England with the invention of new machines which allowed large-scale mass production of goods. These machines were placed into factories, which quickly became an important source of employment for hundreds of thousands of semi-skilled laborers. The English did what they could to maintain their industrial dominance and keep their machines from being replicated, but one way or another the plans reached America. One important figure was Samuel Slater, often called the father of the factory system in America. Slater was a British mechanic who escaped England in disguise, having memorized plans for textile machines, thus enabling the development of factories and mills in America. Slater's machines, coupled with Eli Whitney's cotton gin, created an industrial economy where southern cotton fed northern factories, which were established in the rocky hills of New England where crops struggled to grow. Slater laid the foundations, but more significant for the development of new mill towns was Francis Cabot Lowell, an American merchant. He did not originally intend to be a mill owner, but his travels in England from 1810 to 1812 sparked his interest in the textile industry. Like Slater, Lowell memorized plans for textile looms and machines, and brought his knowledge back to America. Unlike Slater, however, he was not a mercenary. Rather than selling his plans, he formed the Boston Manufacturing Company and used the plans to build the first large-scale textile mill in America, in Waltham, Massachusetts. Lowell died in 1817 before the mill in Waltham was complete, but his standards were the basis for later development in the textile industry and set in motion the evolution of the mill town. The phrase mill town is not at all a misnomer, as much as it might seem to be an exaggeration, for the mill was the physical and symbolic center of the town, around which all other structures were built. Often the mills were constructed in towns which had not been economically significant or successful, and the mills had revitalizing power which motivated growth. In some mill towns, up to two-thirds of citizens worked in the mills themselves, and many others were employed in supporting the mills from the outside. Particularly important to Lowell's Boston Manufacturing Company was creating a place where the female mill workers could be both safe and entertained. To that end, the company contracted social workers and urban planners to beautify and improve the cities and towns where mills were built, and provide ways for the women in the mills to improve their minds. This led to urban centers around mills, which included churches, libraries, stores, schools, and housing. Michel Chevalier, a Frenchman who visited Lowell, commented on the community there. No one in this country is astonished to see the daughters of landowners leave their town and their parents after having received a passable education, to travel alone fifty or a hundred leagues to inhabit a new town where they know no one, and spend three or four years in a state of isolation and independence. They are under the safeguard of the public faith. When one reflects on the dangers to which the opposite system exposes the poor girl who doesn't have anyone to watch over her, it is very difficult not to recognize that the Anglo-American prudery is well worth the ease of our tolerant manners. Unlike the British mill owners, Lowell intended to provide a suitable place for women to work for only a few years, not a lifetime, and he accomplished that goal. Women worked in relative safety and happiness, and went on to marriage or further education in colleges designed especially for former mill workers. The town of Waltham flourished, and continued to provide work for thousands of women, and the success of the mill there prompted further expansion of the textile industry and led to the construction of other mills, such as one in Lowell, Massachusetts in 1821, and another in Manchester, New Hampshire, built by the Amoskeg Company starting in 1838. 
As the mill spread, some people were resistant to the new culture that arose. A farmer from Vermont expressed regret that people were no longer securely and honorably employed in a neighbor's service. Moderate farmers now see their daughters quitting home, exposed to the thousand temptations of a crowded city, a promiscuous population and ill-chosen associates. In general, however, there was a sense of contentment both in and out of the mills. The clangor of the mills, which some complained of, was to others a sign of hard work and industriousness, and the transience of mill employees, which some dismissed as shiftiness, was recognized by others as an important component of the pioneering migrant spirit of America. Furthermore, the economic success was unquestioned. The mills had created a burgeoning middle class which had not been seen before, and the mill workers' labor supported a new group of wealthy individuals, mill owners and the like, who lived luxuriously, employing housekeepers and nannies, eating sumptuously, and sending their daughters to finishing school in Europe. This period of relative optimism and success was not to last. Starting just before the Civil War, foreign immigration, especially of Irish and French Canadians, began to sharply increase. The federal government had not yet put in place a way to limit movement to America, and hundreds of thousands of people of many nationalities emigrated to the United States, and especially to the Northeast, which was often a natural ending point for the journey through Ellis Island or south from Canada. Because of this immigration, the mills, which had previously been a place for women to work for a few years, became an important source of income for many individuals and families. The immigrant population did not have family to return to or the hope of a future after the mills, and since they were willing to work for lower wages, they soon supplanted Yankee women as the primary labor force in the textile mills in the Northeast. Along with the shift in workers' intentions from short-term employment to long-term career work came a shift in culture in the Northeast. Nativism erupted sharply in opposition to the new immigrants and precluded the possibility of easy, peaceful cooperation among workers and their bosses. Violence against the Irish in particular was so extreme that Catholic churches burned to the ground in dozens of New England towns. Around this time, a new generation of mill owners, without Francis Cabot Lowell's vision, began to run the textile industry. The lower job standards of immigrants allowed the new leadership to reduce wages and increase the length of the work week with little protest. Immigration and its immediate effects permanently changed the face of the textile industry in New England and fomented a long overdue conflict, the Lawrence Strike of 1912. Although the Lawrence Strike is often overshadowed by other labor disputes, such as the Pullman Workers' Strike of 1922 or the Steel Strike of 1919, it was a significant moment in the history of the textile industry. Before the strike, workers' lives had already deteriorated. Immigration and new bosses had made living conditions worse and set weekly wages at approximately $9 in the American Woolen Company's factories in Lawrence, Massachusetts. Workers' injuries and general safety also became a concern following the 1911 fire at the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory in Manhattan, New York, which claimed the lives of 146 workers. In general, textile workers were filled with a sense of injustice and were acutely aware of their mistreatment. On January 11, 1911, shortly after a decrease in the length of the work week, workers opened their pay envelopes to find that their pay had decreased by 32 cents, nearly $8 in modern currency. The Industrial Workers of the World, or IWW, a syndicalist union with very small membership, immediately took the lead in fighting back against the American woolen bosses printing and distributing pamphlets, scheduling meetings with the 20,000 striking workers, and calling in well-known IWW organizers Joseph Edor and Arturo Giovanniti to provide relief to workers. The IWW was also responsible for the creation of four key demands for American woolen, a 15% pay hike, a 50-hour work week, double pay for overtime labor, and the ceasing of discrimination against union workers. The strike came to a head when Ettore and Giovanniti were arrested for the death of a woman striker, although they were miles away from her when she died. The imprisonment and eventual trial of Ettore and Giovanniti was picked up by major news outlets and helped win support for the strikers, while simultaneously showing the American woolen bosses to be corrupt. In the face of public hostility, and upon the strikers' rejection of any concessions less than their original demands, the company owners finally buckled 
and met all four of the strikers' conditions. This was a temporary victory for the textile workers, but it marked a turning point in the industry. There could no longer be any doubt that workers and bosses were on opposing sides. In fact, within two years, the American Woolen Company had entirely reversed the progress of the Lawrence strike. World War I revitalized the industry temporarily, as government contracts enabled mills to pay workers more and meet more of their demands. Still, textiles in New England were unarguably on the decline. After the end of World War I, conflict once again set in between workers and bosses in the form of the textile strike of 1922. There are 85,000 workers on strike in the New England textile mills, 8,000 in the cotton mills of the Pawtuxet Valley, and 15,000 in the Blackstone Valley of Rhode Island, 33,000 in the New Hampshire mills, 13,000 more at Lawrence, Massachusetts, and 16,000 in other New England towns. Evans Clark, The Nation. This strike began in Rhode Island, where a large group of mill owners decided simultaneously to cut wages by 20% since the country was entering a post-war recession. Workers in Rhode Island were joined by workers in other states as mill owners around the region also decided to cut wages. In this case, the workers did not have the same union support as in the Lawrence strike, and despite their reasonable demands and the support of an informed public, they still lost. Their wages remained cut in most cases, and the length of their work week was increased or stayed unresolved. Mills around New England began functioning almost normally, but the strike had given an important blow. Employee and customer loyalty began to decrease and technology, which had birthed the Industrial Revolution in the Northeast, became its downfall. Water power was supplanted by petroleum and electricity, and this meant that factories could be built in the South, thus saving on transportation costs. Most mills began to close their doors, and formerly bustling towns went dead as workers looked elsewhere for jobs. Fall River, Massachusetts had, at one point, 111 mills, but they all closed. The city of the dinner pail no longer woke at 6 a.m. or rang with the sounds of the army of industrial workers. Fall River had receded into obscurity. Its workers, who had once created a proud community of operatives and the strongest union movement in textiles, now fought desperately for the few remaining jobs. John T. Cumbler By the 1950s, even the giants in Lowell and Waltham had closed their doors, and eventually less than two dozen remained in the United States. The mill is gone, but not forgotten. The buildings may have been turned to rubble or converted to other businesses, but the contribution of the mill is inestimable. Dozens of northeastern towns, Bath, Maine, Burlington, Vermont, Lebanon, New Hampshire, might not exist at all were it not for the mills and the towns they created. Those clanking, clattering hubs of activity may have closed their doors, but their place in the fabric of American history can never be erased.